When I say addiction, you probably think of substances first. Cigarettes, alcohol, caffeine, drug addiction. But you might also then think of new addictions. Work, social media, phone screens, gaming, YouTube, even performance addictions. These are so-called behavioural addictions. And the way we talk about them leads to a broader question. Is the very face of addiction changing? In fact, so many of our addictions seem to be becoming, instead, online ones. As our psychologies fuse into the hyper-real, postmodern, screen-attached cyber-psychologies, symbiotic with tech itself and dependent on it, what happens to those compulsions that we feel? That pull towards clickbait, towards likes, towards doom-scrolling? What's it doing to us? I have addictions. Too many. They're not too bad these days, but I smoke a bit, I drink a bit, I eat too much sugary stuff, I'm drawn to Twitter, and I convince myself that YouTube videos are research because of this job. Even my reading, my work habits, my exercise verge on feeling like addictive compulsions. The modern world, the one that arose out of developments in science, factories, industry, the Enlightenment, was an attempt in many ways, to fix a pre-modern problem, scarcity. What happens when, for some of us, the problem of scarcity is overcome? The modern problem of overcoming scarcity turns on its head and becomes a post-modern problem, that of abundance and excess, from too little to too much. Our wiring has evolved over the course of millennia as a response to the scarce landscape of the savannah. Postmodern life is a constant fight against the ghosts of that wiring. Is that new fight, the new face of addiction, becoming an epidemic? Drug overdoses in the US have tripled since 1990, opioid use has risen by 300%, 300 million of us have an alcohol disorder. In the 20th century, 100 million people died early from smoking. Many psychologists estimate that 1 in 10 Americans qualify for social media addiction. One study estimates that 7% of gamers are problem gamers and 1.4% are addicted. Facebook itself found that Instagram was harmful to teenage girls, 30% of us could be classified as addicted to our phones, 7% of us to gambling and 7% of us to online shopping. So is it true to say that we live in an age of addiction? Philosopher Kent Donington has written Persons with severe addictions are among those contemporary prophets that we ignore to our own demise, for they show us who we truly are. So, what's going on here? If this broad pursuit of pleasure ranges from tobacco to Tetris, sex to social media, booze to buying, gaming to gambling, how do we think about addiction at all? It all seems so broad. So vague. The American Society of Addiction Medicine defines addiction like this. Addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviours that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Of course, Addiction is complex, personal, subjective, but I think two parts of that definition are important. Compulsion, the pull of addiction, the diminishing of our free will to resist, and the harmful consequences. We live in a constantly shifting context of addictive hooks, 
environments designed to draw us in, to pull our behaviour, to advertise pleasures, to flash signs and slogans and headlines and photos, to notify us of trivial but tempting updates. We live in an attention society that seeks to take possession of our minds over and over from all directions. In fact, studies have shown that substance addictions, to nicotine say, and behavioural addictions, to phones say, are indistinguishable in brain scans. Cocaine addiction and gambling addictions, for example, show similar patterns in cues, cravings, dopamine release, withdrawal symptoms, and so on. Professor of Marketing, Adam Alter, in his book, Irresistible, says that there's a pattern that describes the brain of a drug addict as he injects heroin, and a second that describes the brain of a gaming addict as he fires up a new World of Warcraft quest. They turn out to be almost identical. So if all addictions are based on that compulsion, combined with harmful consequences, how can we think about the historic change towards these new, postmodern addictions? In a 1993 Wired article on this new thing called the internet, Mitchell Kapoor predicted that we could wind up with networks that have the principal effect of fostering addiction to a new generation of electronic narcotics. Glitzy interactive multimedia successors to Nintendo and MTV, their principal themes revolving around instant gratification through sex, violence or sexual violence, their uses and content determined by mega corporations pushing mindless consumption of things we don't need and aren't good for us. He then asks, what could prevent such a fate? Is the internet just the logical culmination of our history of trying to make pleasures ever present? We've built entire civilizations and progress on the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. As psychiatrist Anna Lembic writes, as a result, we've transformed the world from a place of scarcity to a place of overwhelming abundance. We've evolved for scarcity and live in some cases, and in some places, with abundance. The industrial, modern, capitalist pursuit of pleasures on demand is what historian David Courtright has called limbic capitalism. He says that limbic capitalism is a technologically advanced way of doing business that encourages excessive compulsion and addiction. Targeting of the limbic system are quick emotional reactions feelings, our deepest evolutionary desires, our base impulses, sugar, money, celebrity, sex, gambling, luxury. Throughout history, we've sought to institutionalise and secure these pleasures. Food, drink, shelter are the most obvious, but we've also sought to maximise the potency and availability of things by distilling spirits, building casinos, producing cartons of cigarettes, brothels, creating slave trades for sugar, global fast food supply chains, designing persuasive social media systems, and Hollywood. Limbic capitalists seek to supply pleasure and reap predictable profits. In 1663, the mathematician Giolamo Cadano carefully studied many gambling games and created lists of probabilities of outcomes, wins and losses. Further mathematicians made it possible for casinos and lotteries to professionalise gambling and make the extraction of profits from gamblers a scientific pursuit. In casinos, Add booze, women, food, cigarettes, take away natural light, etc. Add beds to sleep in, and you have a winning hand. Today, big tech giants work on the probabilities of you opening an app at a certain time of day. The best way to predict what you'll click like on or share. Sales in your inbox work on the chance of you responding to a certain percentage off at a certain time. It could be said that we've built civilizations on the pursuit of dopamine, 
the most important neurotransmitter in our brain, the feel-good chemical, the reward molecule. What's interesting about dopamine is that it might be more important for the expectation of reward than the reward itself. Dopamine is central to addiction. The more dopamine released, the more addictive the drug. When we engage in addictive behaviours, we get a burst of dopamine. Then, our homeostasis system, the system that balances and regulates our body, tips the other way, producing withdrawal symptoms. The dopamine released is a reward for behaviour that we assume is good, fun, exciting, social and so on. But usually, evolutionarily speaking, it was also rare, a treat sugars and fats being the prime example. When we have too much of these things, our dopamine baseline drops to balance out. We down-regulate. We get that big reward, that big hit, then our system has to recover. We experience withdrawal, dullness, boredom, temptation and so on. We also build up a tolerance. We require more and more of the thing to get the same result the same fix, and we spend more of our time pursuing it, resulting in many cases in an unbalanced life, an unnourished life. Now, we instinctively know this when it comes to booze, caffeine and other substances. We get hangovers and crashes, but remember, the brain scans of the heroin addict and the World of Warcraft addict look identical. Dopamine spikes, withdrawal symptoms, tolerance, apply to social media as much as to cigarettes, as much to sugar as it does to phones. Before we get back to limbic capitalism, one of the most fascinating findings in studies of dopamine is that it's not just released as a reward, but also, and maybe even more importantly, in the expectation of a reward. Memory is central to the release of dopamine. We remember a certain cue, a certain pattern, predict or remember a certain outcome and get excited. We see a fast food restaurant or a pub. I have a beer and think cigarette. Our mouth salivates at cooking food. Gamblers get as excited when the slot machine starts spinning than from the win itself. What we get in all of these things are cues. We get a little cue when our phone buzzes. Dopamine is released in expectation of what it is, more than the what it is itself. Cues, the expectation of reward, or hooks, are central to postmodern addictions. I can feel a slow stream of dopamine release when I'm out exploring the experience of novelty, anticipation, thinking through new things in real time, all reward with dopamine release. But too much of any good thing becomes a problem when it tips us off balance. Too much work, too much sugar, too much gambling, too much social media. And under limbic capitalism, those hooks, corporate signs, logos, headlines, notifications, games, that promise of a big hit of dopamine, drawing us in like the siren song, it's all everywhere. And here's the biggest problem with limbic capitalism. 80% of alcohol sales go to 20% of the heaviest users. The gambling industry makes 80% of profits from 20% of gamblers. In social media use, the top 1% of users create the majority of content. Limbic hooks appeal to the most vulnerable among us, those that are most likely to form addictions, those with psychological needs, those in poverty, kids, those of us with genetic predispositions towards addiction, but they appeal to the most vulnerable among us and the most vulnerable parts of us. Alter says that a staggering 41% of the population has suffered from at least one behavioural addiction over the past 12 months. 
When we're surrounded by dopamine on tap, when we live in that age of abundance, an opioid epidemic, fried food everywhere, booze everywhere, online gambling 24-7, social connection 24-7, the promise of novelty 24-7, any film or video at any time, any music at any time, when we have a lack in our lives, a psychological need, it becomes easy to replace it with a crutch. And social isolation, a lack of social support, trauma, poverty, genetics combined with ease of access and potency, engineered weed, strong alcohol, hyper-tuned online gambling, etc. are all predictors for addiction. What we see under limbic capitalism is the design and production of sophisticated techniques to appeal to the release of dopamine, the mathematization of gambling, the use of new printing techniques and bold colors to grab our attention, the proliferation of signs and sounds to draw us into apps and adverts, autoplay, algorithms to predict what you like when you like it, headlines that will fire your fight and flight, and the most powerful of all, the simple screen. In short, cues and hooks are ubiquitous, everywhere tempting the promise of quick rewards. And so the key to the attention economy, a subpart of limbic capitalism, is to dangle digital drugs that are likeable, clickable, repeatable, that entice, persuade and cajole us. Just think how different your everyday landscape is to how we've evolved. You probably know the story. Odysseus, on his way home, gets his crew to tie him to the mask to hear the siren song for himself. That sweet, alluring, melodious sound that draws seafarers towards the rocks while his shipmates put wax in their ears as they navigate past. Homer's Odyssey is a foundational story in human history. Is it any wonder that this temptation towards sweetness and doom, a metaphor for many things, is such a well-known part of that story, such a well-known warning in human psychology? There's something primordial about the warning of the pull down the dopaminergic tract. Some kind of original sin, maybe. How many times have you seen a notification like this and been compelled to click and see what's new? How many times a day do you check your email on autopilot? How many times have you not noticed that the reason you're drawn to this notification sign is because it's in red to get your attention? Game designers use compelling feedback rewards, sounds, flashes, animations that reinforce the reward of that little dopamine hit. Virtual reality will make all of this multi-sensory. In his History of Attention, Tim Wu writes that the inventor of email, Stephen Lukasik, was arguably the first to develop that little habit that consumes the attention of so many of us, the check-in the impulse triggered by the intrusive thought that whatever else one is doing, I need to check my email. 70% of office emails are read within 6 seconds. Accounts are checked 36 times every hour. Almost half of people describe this compulsive checking as a loss of control. We've become addicted to inbox zero, to running streaks on our sports watches, to duolingo streaks, to posting once a day, to beating a high score, to catching up on that last Netflix cliffhanger. Once one company starts vying for our attention, it sets in motion a chain of competition in which you either present your hook, your corporate hook, your gesture to the world, your demand for attention, or you get outhooked yourself. You go out of business, you lose in the great game of content creation that we now live in. Wu writes that under competition, the race will naturally run to the bottom. Attention will almost invariably gravitate towards the more garish, lurid, outrageous alternative, 
whatever stimulus may more likely engage what cognitive scientists call our automatic attention as opposed to our control attention, the kind we direct with intent. The sirens of our postmodern addictions tempt us away from the physical world to our phone screens. In 1958, Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World, wrote that the development of a vast mass communications industry concerned in the main neither with the true nor the false, but with the unreal, the more or less totally irrelevant, failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. Even our goals become a hook that can turn into addiction. We must beat the last video view. We must get more likes than the last post. I must get more views on this video than the last one. I must run a faster pace than last week. Must beat that high score on a game. Must get more followers. Goals are everywhere. Alter writes that the internet has exposed people to goals they barely knew existed, and wearable tech devices have made goal tracking effortless and automatic. Where once you had to seek out new goals, today they land, often uninvited, in your inbox and on your screen. Metrics, analytics, the comparing of yourself to everyone on the planet closes the gap between performance and possibility, and with it comes pressure. Why do we become addicted to social media? There are many factors, but a few universal ones stand out to me as interesting. First, novelty. As hunter-gatherers, we're wired to seek the new, exploring whether in the wild or in the digital wilderness is addictive. Another is that big tech have learned a lot from the gambling industry. Studies have shown that the maybe factor, the idea of maybe getting a win, the maybe of having a new email, a new friend request, the thrill of the chase, releases more dopamine than the win itself. In studies, pigeons peck a button to release food more furiously when the food is released randomly instead of consistently. The like button changed the psychology of sharing. We now gamble with the maybe factor each time we share something new. A new photo, a new update, a new video. How will people respond to it? Social media uses what psychologists call variable reinforcement. The rewards vary, and studies have found that variable reinforcement is the best way to train animals into obedient habits. Casinos use so-called luck ambassadors. When you're near your point of giving up and leaving, when you've lost repeatedly, someone's dispatched to give you a free drink or a voucher. In the same way, when you haven't logged into an app or a game for a while, you get a free little update, a notification, a gift of some coins or a special piece of news. Philosopher James Williams proposes a thought experiment. How would you design a society as weak-willed as possible? It would, he says, deliver an endless supply of informational rewards on demand, whether that's outrage headlines or cute cat photos. And what's worrying is that those informational rewards become more and more personalised to suit our particular weaknesses. Professor of Psychiatry David Greenfield, who founded the Centre for Internet and Technology Addiction, says that the internet amplifies the intoxicating impact of stimulating content via the efficient delivery mechanism into our nervous system. He describes the internet with its variable rewards, beeps, buzzes, colours, flashes, animations and notifications as the world's largest slot machine. As the slot machine gets even more sophisticated, it's only going to get harder to resist. An early pioneer of the idea of behavioural addictions, the psychologist Stanton Peel said that an addiction is an extreme dysfunctional attachment to an experience that is acutely harmful to a person, but that is an essential part of the person's ecology 
and that the person cannot relinquish. The word ecology stands out to me there. Ecology, landscape, the world that we find ourselves in. The internet, of course, is the new digital landscape and the hooks and cues, a new indispensable part of our lives. But does that mean we should wander through the digital landscape and just give in to it? The idea of ecology and addiction is so essential that during the Vietnam War heroin epidemic, many in America were fearful of what would happen when veterans that had become addicted to heroin serving in Vietnam brought that addiction home with them. Politicians in particular feared a widespread heroin epidemic on domestic soil. But it didn't really happen. Many who were addicted in Vietnam didn't bring that particular problem back with them. The reason was that the ecology, the landscape, the relationship back home was completely different. The same cues and hooks weren't there anymore. Williams has described computers as wondrous machines that also appeal to the lowest parts of us. Like all technology, the value of something like a phone is of course neutral. It's what we do with the tech that matters. To combat postmodern addictions, there are two paths. We need to both better arm ourselves, educate ourselves and foster a culture of awareness, and design and create responsible landscapes that protect vulnerable people, kids, addicts, and the vulnerable parts within all of us. Arming yourself is difficult. Many psychologists have argued that abstinence alone is rarely enough. Instead, we need to focus on the psychological needs that the addictions are a cover for, something that's not being fulfilled in the moment. Psychiatrist Anne Lembick writes that many of us use high dopamine substances and behaviours to distract ourselves from our own thoughts. I think the trick to beating an addiction is to replace it with something new, something else, something more meaningful. To allow yourself to think about what the need is in the moment. Ask honestly why the compulsion is there. Escape, fun, boredom, fear, a reward. Then try to replace the addictive behaviour with a new habit that does the same job psychologically. Twitter doom scrolling is the result of needing a break and seeking novelty. Go for a walk instead or flick through a paper. AA teaches to avoid the hooks and cues, people, places and things that trigger compulsive behaviour. Remember, the expectation of reward is difficult to resist once the hook has lodged itself under your skin. If Twitter is open in a visible tab, it's much more difficult to resist clicking to see what the notification is than if you're logged out. Notifications can be turned off on your phone. But the idea that we should all just work to resist the limbic temptations that surround us is a naive neoliberal dream. We should focus on the landscape of hooks and cues too. The designers of the system and our laws and regulations are all responsible for the structure of our experience. The problem with relying on the individual to resist limbic temptations is that, as design ethicist Tristan Harris says, willpower is not enough when there are a thousand people on the other side of the screen whose job it is to break down the self-regulation that you have. And Devangi Vivrakar says that portraying the problem as one in which we need to be more mindful of our interaction with apps can be likened to saying that we need to be more mindful of our behaviour while interacting with the artificial intelligence algorithms that beat us at chess. Equally sophisticated algorithms beat us at the attention game all the time. Billions of dollars and millions of engineers, programmers, designers, even psychologists and focus groups all spend their time and attention working out how to attract your attention. So in response, 
we must focus our attention on demanding effective digital landscapes that align with our goals and needs rather than appeal to the weakest parts of ourselves and prey on those addictive tendencies within us and are a danger to our kids. In one survey, half of kids said they felt addicted to their phone and three quarters felt compelled to respond to texts, posts and notifications immediately. Self-harm posts and self-harm itself seems to be on the rise. Excessive gaming is correlated with negative mental health outcomes. Excessive social media use correlated with anxiety and depression. Early adulthood is the highest risk age for developing addictions. If you don't develop an addiction earlier in life, you're less likely to develop one later on. And one big reason for this is that, as Alter says, young adults are bombarded by a galaxy of responsibilities that they're not equipped to handle. They learn to medicate by taking up substances or behaviours that dull the insistent sting of those persistent hardships. Combine this with having devices on tap that provide consistent drips of dopamine on demand and we could be on course for a generational disaster. Ask most parents of kids that age and they'll tell you it's impossible to resist the pressure for kids to have phone and social media accounts when all of their friends do. It becomes unfair on them. If they're the only ones without, it's just as harmful for them to be ostracised. And so the duty of care, the duty to do something, must instead fall on institutions, schools, governments, regulation and the social media and big tech giants themselves. There's a quote I find interesting from the American philosopher Matthew Crawford. He says, The left's project of liberation led us to dismantle inherited cultural jigs that once imposed a certain coherence, for better and worse, on individual lives. This created a vacuum of cultural authority that has been filled, opportunistically, with attentional landscapes that get installed by whatever choice architect brings the most energy to the task, usually because it sees the profit potential. I think what he means is that, historically, we had authoritative guides about how we should act. They came from places like the church, from cultural ideas of things like masculinity, what acceptable decorum might be, what should or shouldn't be allowed on television and radio and so on. But those cultural, political and social guides have largely disappeared and been replaced with the market. At their worst, those cultural jigs, as he calls them, restricted us. But at their best, they provided a kind of landscape an ecology that guided us. In replacing them with the market, we leave ourselves open to whoever can attract our attention as the highest bidder with the sweetest, most addictive hook. And that's dangerous. When it comes to traditional addictive substances, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, we intervene in their use in several ways by limiting access, by restricting by age, or say by regulating their ingredients to make sure they're safe. We do the same for casinos and gambling and for advertising drugs and other addictive substances. We also have cultural and social expectations and media pressure to make sure substances are made and sold responsibly. In liberal societies, both are meant to be a light touch. Adults should be left to make their own decisions. But I think there is legitimate reason to regulate when addictive technologies are affecting the most vulnerable. Regulation and our expectations of platforms like social media should be designed to protect categories like children and addicts. I think these labels, for example, that we have on cigarettes and tobacco over here, this one says tobacco smoke contains over 70 substances known to cause cancer. I think they're a good example of light touch regulation, although I'm unsure how much they work, they don't do much for me, but I think the intention is good. Should the same sort of warnings be on social media? Should the social media age limit be at least 16, not 13 say? 
should we expect push notifications to our phones to be turned off by default when we install new apps? Yes, we should. There are plenty of light touch solutions that stop short of being blunt instruments that simply ban websites or get involved in what can and can't be posted. We often think of regulation as too black and white. Another one would be autoplay being turned off by default. In Algorithms of Fear, Vail Gonim writes that we're not driving people to content that could help us as a society. You can build algorithms and experiences that are designed to get the best out of people and you can build algorithms and experiences that drive out the worst. It's our job as civic technologists to build experience that drive the best. We can do that. We must do that now. This is one of the biggest problems with giving in to the race to the bottom, limbic capitalism, dangled digital sugar in front of everyone's eyes of neoliberalism. The cyber ecology becomes full of addictive hooks that we have no protection against. Recently, I keep coming back to this quote from the sociologist Sigmund Bauman. He writes, The deep contradiction of our age is the yawning gap between the right of self-assertion and the capacity to control the social settings which render such self-assertion feasible. It's from that abysmal gap that the most poisonous effluvia contaminating the lives of contemporary individuals emanate. To fight that poisonous effluvia, we must take back control. Thank you as always for watching, and a huge thanks of course, as always, to my Patreons, without which this just wouldn't be possible. So if you want to see scripts, if you want to chat in the Discord server, if you want your name in the credits, but most of all, if you just want to help support make this content, then click the link in the description below. If not, you can like, you can share, you can leave a comment, all those things that help the algorithm. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.